Join hands with somebody, if you will, right now, and let's pray together. Now, it's not that I don't trust your praying. It's just that I want to kind of lead you in this prayer if I can do that. Let's all say this together out loud. How many still believe that there is uh, power in agreement? In other words, when we get in agreement, uh, things begin to happen, don't they? So what we want to do tonight, we want to get in agreement as we join hands. It's an outward sign of an inward bond that we believe. That this prayer in agreement will come to pass in the name of Jesus Christ. We believe that, don't we? So let's all say this together out loud. Just repeat this after me, if you will, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you're in this place. Tonight, we declare that our faith is strong. We're not full of fear, we're full of faith. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We take dominion and authority over all the powers of the adversary. Sickness and disease, it must go in the name of Jesus. Everything that Satan brings, we can declare it to be defeated through the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. So we shout victory tonight, victory in our body, in our mind, in our family, in our finances, in everything. We give you praise in Jesus' name for the victory. Amen. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a praise offering tonight. Hallelujah. Well, you may be seated. How many have your Bibles? Hold them up real high tonight and shout this out loud. We preachers do this a lot, don't we? Because we believe it. This isn't just a book of history. This is the infallible, unchanging incorruptible word of the living God. Hallelujah. How many believe that? So hold that Bible up real high and shout this out loud. This is my Bible. This is the word of God. And I stand on it. And I believe it. And I declare it done. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. I can have what the Bible says I can have. And I can do what the Bible says I can do because I believe it in the name of Jesus. And everybody shout amen and amen and amen. So, Neil, stand up over there. Would you do that, my dear? I just want everybody to look look at her. Yeah, yeah. She's pretty. I think we're going to make it now after 52 years. 52. Yeah, yeah. And I keep thinking everything's going good, and she'll say, she'll say, well, you better watch it, Butch. That's all I can say. So I'm trying to watch it. I'm going to try and stick it out with this beautiful, beautiful lady of mine. And what a journey it's been, and I give God all the praise and the glory and the honor. Starting next year, I will be in my 50th year of preaching this glorious gospel. And I'm more excited about it tonight than I've ever been in my life. Just think, I get to be at Cathedral of Faith. Hallelujah. Because a lot of people believe you have to come here to get to heaven. So thank God. Thank God I'm here so I know I'm going to get to heaven. Psalms 137, if you'll turn to it, please. Did anyone ever tell you that once you become a Christian, once you become a child of God, that all your troubles are over? No more problems. No more difficulties. Smooth sailing. Well, I don't know how that's worked out for you, but quite frankly, it's been my experience that the moment you take that step with God, all hell breaks loose. Has anybody else found that to be true? Because the enemy wants to test that commitment you've made to Jesus Christ. Psalms 137 says it this way, 
beginning with verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon we sat down and we wept when we remembered. Everybody say remember. When we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there those who carried us away captive, they required of us a song. Those who plundered us required of us mirth, saying, sing us one of those songs of Zion. Verse 4, but how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign, strange land. Tonight I want to speak to you for a few minutes. If I can give this message a a title, I want to talk to you about something I want to call it one string. One string. Anyone in this room tonight can shout when everything is going good, can't they? All the kids, thank God, they haven't gone half nuts. Some of them's gone all nuts. Uh, the marriage is doing good. The family's intact and there's money in the bank and you've got a promotion in your job. In other words, all the things that we think about that make us feel comfortable and secure in where we are, we, we, can, we can say it's good, isn't it? It's easy to sing when you go to the doctor and you have an examination and there's something in your body that concerns you. And uh, you come away and a few days the phone rings and the doctor says, I have a good report. That that we found is benign and and you finally take a deep sigh of, of relief. And it's this journey that we call life, and it's this journey that we have in this walk with God that our faith is tested in ways that we didn't count on. And then in reverse, you can think about it like this. We can shout when everything is going good and a smile is on our face and we get a good report. Well, anybody can sing then, can't they? But it's a different thing when suddenly your faith is tested. You become a child of God and the marriage becomes shaky and the spouse walks out. The devil walks in and says, let's hear you sing now all you Cathedral of Faith people, all of you noisy ones, when things are going good, you just won't shut up, but when the home is broken, the finances are gone, the job has been lost, and when the doctor says, I have some news that you, we need to get into this and talk about it more, and it is malignant. Well, that's where the enemy comes in, doesn't he? And that's where he tests us in our walk with God and in our faith. Well, there's a wonderful line about faith that I want to give you here tonight that I think is important. And it's important that I think it's one of the best definitions of faith that I've ever had or ever found in all of my life. And it goes something like this. I have pledged my faith. And my fidelity to God, no matter what. If the doctor says I have six months to live or 60 years to live, it's not going to change my faith. I'm going to praise him when I have health, but I've made a decision. I'm going to praise him when the doctor says I do not have good health. I'm going to praise him if my marriage is intact. Or no matter what happens in that marriage and no matter how fragile it has become, I'm going to praise him anyway. I'm going to praise him if I have money in the bank. I'm going to praise him if I have a good job. But I want the devil to know something tonight. If I'm down to my last five cents 
If I have lost my job, I want to send this shockwave right across the bow of his boat and let him know, no matter what, I'm in this for the duration. No matter what, I'm in this, and no matter what, I will never lose my song. Now listen to me very closely. The greatest violinist that's ever lived, and it's uh, arguably, it is without a doubt, the greatest violinist, his name is uh, Paganini. And Paganini was known around the world because he played before kings and princes and presidents and prime ministers and he was uh, and is still to this day noted as the greatest man that ever took a bow in hand and laid it across the Stratus Veris. No one can compare with a Paganini. He could, as many say, it was almost like he could make that Stratus Veris talk. So Paganini was playing in one of his favorite Italian audiences in Rome. There's the Pope and Prime ministers and kings have come in to hear this uh, uh, great artist to play. And they sit there in this great hall, and Paganini takes that bow and lays it on the strings of that Stradivarius, and, and he begins uh, to play. Just a little history about the Stradivarius, if I may, before I proceed with this, because the Stradivarius is known as an instrument that the wood in the Strativ Stradivarius comes from uh, like no other violin that's ever made. In other words, if you were to go to the most harsh country or land in the world and the highest altitude, and when you get to the highest altitude there, you find a certain tree whose name I still have not been able to pronounce, but it's in the most rugged, high, harsh uh, weather that you could find, and out of that tree where the wind blows and the temperatures drop below zero, and not only from that tree, but when that tree is taken, the tree is taken after being battered by the most severe winters and weather imaginable, but they only use the north side of that tree because that's where it's hammered the hardest. And it is said that the reason the Stradivarius makes the most beautiful music is because the conditions under which it survived. Out of those conditions, only wood can come that will go into a Stradivarius because the Stradivarius, that wood has come from such territory to where nothing else could survive. And anything that could survive in that harsh climate emits the most beautiful sound the world has ever heard. And if you're going through a storm tonight and you feel like that tree that's up on that mountaintop where the temperature plunges to below zero and the harsh winds can come at 100 miles an hour, no wonder you can sing the sweetest songs that's ever been sung because you have been through the storm and now you're singing the Lord's song under the most harsh conditions. And while Paganini is playing that Stradivarius, suddenly a string breaks. Poor Paganini. Now it's Paganini on three strings. And the crowd is going, what will Paganini do now? But Paganini just keeps right on playing. What do you do when the enemy comes in and interrupts your life and there's only now three strings left? Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to just keep right on singing and we're going to keep right on playing. It's important to note that the background of Psalms 137 is important that we underscore this because these people, these Jewish Israelis, if you will, have been plucked up out of their land. And they've been taken to a harsh climate, if you will. 
It's not their land, but now they're in a foreign land. They're in a place that they're not familiar with. Let me interject something here tonight. I feel the power of the Holy Spirit in these words that's coming out of my mouth that there's going to be some people in this room that's going to rise up and they're going to let the devil to know, know there's some new rules in town. Bring it on because no matter what it is, you will never take my song. And then the enemy would come and the enemy would say, to these Israelis living in a foreign land that had taken their harps, uh, Pastor uh, Ken, and had placed them over on the willows. And their captors would come up to them and say, let's hear you sing now. Well, you got that bad report. Well, let's hear you sing now. You've been attacked. Well, let's hear you sing now, you cathedral of faith people, you that profess so much. Let's hear you sing now. Let's hear you sing now when you only have three strings left. Pocanini just keeps right on playing, and right in the middle of that, a second string breaks. And now it's poor Pocanini. Everybody say, poor Pocanini on Two strings, two strings. People wonder what's he going to do now. Well, he's going to just keep right on playing. You see what the enemy is after? He's after that song. You see, you have a choice to make. And that choice is that I can give in or give up or I can quit. But you see, deep down inside, you know that you know that no matter what comes against you, Romans 8, 37 comes into play. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Romans 8, 38 must be accounted for. (laughs) For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This would make a Presbyterian want to shout here tonight because no matter what, I have read the end of the book and we win the whole thing. These are not just little cute quips or words, uh, little, uh, uh, some kind of little positive thinking uh, discourse. This is based on fact. This is based on fact that God's reputation is at stake. And what God brings to life, the devil cannot kill it. And the life that is in you cannot be extinguished by all the combined counsel of the devil. You have not only started with him, you will conclude your journey. And you will not only conclude it, you will conclude it with the praise of God resounding from your lips. Can I hear an amen in this room? I sense tonight, Zonel, did you notice last night that meeting that we had with Pastor Kenny Foreman? I'm telling you, by the time he got through for three hours, I felt like I could get up and kick a wall down. There was such joy in his spirit. Hallelujah. There was such an anointing that was upon him. Oh, Dwight, he would say, I want you to know my faith is in God. And we're walking after that three-hour meal. And he said, it doesn't matter what happened. My faith is in the living God. And it was almost like I could see a right cross across the jaw of the devil and a left cross across. You know why? Because the devil cannot take your song. Pacanini's still playing on that violin. Let's don't forget him. And all of a sudden, that third string breaks. And now it's poor Pacanini on one string. And life started out, didn't it, in your walk with God with a compliment of four strings on your Stradivarius. And it was looking good. 
And all of a sudden, the enemy showed up out there on your front lawn. And he brought heavy artillery. And he begins to batter your life and test your testimony. And he's saying, oh, you cathedral of faith people, let's hear you sing now. And the enemy comes in like a flood and attacks and keeps attacking. And it's just unrelenting his pursuit to cause you to lose that song and a second string breaks and something else happens and you think it couldn't get any worse and a third string breaks well what do you do when the third string breaks and it looks like that's right brother I work alone up here I'll get to that in just a minute (laughs) he shouted out you keep on playing that's what you do you help me all you want to you just keep on playing don't you So see, the fact of the matter is, we're in this thing for the duration. We're not in this because he throws obstacles in our way. We're not in this. I want to tell you something. Those bumps he puts in the way, those mountains he puts in the way, when you know God, they become stepping stones for you. When you know who God is, you don't have to run to God and tell him how big that mountain is. When you know who God is, you go to that mountain and you tell that mountain how big your God is. And that's what people of faith do. Well, Pacanini just kept on playing that violin and people were just absolutely awestruck at the perseverance of this man on that Stradivarius. He played, finally, the finale on one string. He would later say, as I came to the conclusion of that on one string, Pacanini said, the last thing I was hoping to hear was the word encore. And when he concluded that last note, and there was Pacanini with the crowd on their feet, roaring as that one string only remained on that violin. And suddenly the crowd began to scream, Encore! 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 And in the most severest testing of your life, the devil shouts, Encore! Encore! Pacanini held up that violin with three strings dangling and one string intact. And he had his audience be seated. True story. And he took that bow in hand, laid it on that one string, and he began to play Amazing Grace How sweet the sound. Oh, I feel a shout coming on. Anybody want to help me a little bit? I feel a... Don't kiss up to me now. It's too late. You had a good shot at it while ago. And he began to play through many dangers, toils, and snares. I have already come. It's grace. It's brought us safe thus far and it's grace that's going to see us through I'm here to tell you tonight it doesn't matter how bleak it appears it doesn't matter how often the enemy may attack I want to tell you something the sweetest sounds that can emit from your vocal cords are not songs of victory when you're on top of a mountain The sweetest sounds do not come from your lips when the marriage is doing good and the kids are all doing great and the doctor has said you have good health. But I'm here to tell you, it's wonderful when you're on a mountaintop and everything that is going good, you can sing with joy in your heart. But I'm here to tell you what we're going to do tonight, that no matter what the test No matter what the trial, 
no matter if we have only one string left, no matter if the doctor says we have six months to live, we serve notice on the devil. There's one thing that he will never take from us. He will never take our song. He will never take our joy. He will never take our victory. Are there any victory people in the house tonight? Because victory is ours, saith the Lord. Now I want to bring this to a close with this because it's, it's upon my heart. There's a man by the name of T.K. Leonard. He pastors in a place called Finley, Ohio. He has a Pentecostal church there and a, a Bible school. And years ago, T.K. Leonard, he, he was always struggling. Uh, Pastor Ken, he, he never had enough to get the Bible school off the ground, and he will, always was praying, said, Lord, send somebody, and it looked like the school was going to close up, and it looked like the, the church was having a difficult time making it, and he said, Lord, we need help. Send somebody to help, and he got a phone call, and on the other end of the line was the wife of the most wealthy man in the city. In fact, one wing of the uh, hospital was built by this family. And the first thing on T.K. Uh, Leonard's mind after getting that phone call, which went like this, she said, are you Reverend Leonard? He said, I am. She said, are you uh, the one that believes in the Bible? He said, I do indeed. She said, well, I, I, the doctors have said they can do my husband no good, and he's at the point of death, and he's had a, an attack, and the doctor said he won't live probably for another uh, hour or two. Would you come and bring your Bible and read a scripture over my husband? T.K. Leonard, his own words where I hung up that phone, and he said, I have to admit it. I thought, well, maybe this is the way God is going to meet our need. This is the wealthiest man in our town, and maybe he's the one that's going to help us out of our dilemma. And if I can just read my scriptures just right and so on. So he stopped by his little Bible school to pick up his choice student that he had so much confidence in. And he said to his students, now listen, we're going to this multimillionaire's home, and all I want you to do is just observe. When we get inside that mansion, you stand against the wall, and you just observe. Because there will be an occasion possibly that you learn from this. So I want you to know what to do when people of this caliber call. And T.K. Leonard said, we walked into that mansion and I instructed my young college Bible student to stand right there against the door and don't make any noise. And he, the wife showed me over and there was this man that everybody in the town knew. And he's laying there and he appears to be totally unconscious. And he said, I opened up my Bible and I read Psalms 23. And he said, in fact, I read, it, I read it more beautifully than I'd ever read it in my life. My bedside manners were impeccable. And he said, I read the 23rd Psalm. But just before I got to the end of that Psalm, coming across that room was that Bible student that had been told by this preacher, nothing is impossible with God. <laughs> That all things are possible to him that believeth. And that the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. I have good news for you tonight. God does not bow the knee to the name cancer. But cancer has to bow the knee to the name of Jesus Christ. At the name of Jesus every knee will bow. And that young Bible student walked across that room took that Bible and placed it on the chest of that dying man and threw his hand on top of that Bible. And he didn't pray a cute little bedside prayer, but he did say this, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I call death out of that body. I call it out in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And then with that, he took his hand and slammed it down on top of that Bible. And when he did, that man coughed. Now then, there's confusion. He's coughing. The guy is coughing. And Dr. Finley said, I didn't know what to do. And he said, I grabbed my Bible. I apologize to that dear woman. And 
And I looked at the man and I thought to my mind, oh my Lord, if he's not going to die before, he's sure going to die now. After what that college student did, he said, I grabbed that young boy and out the door we went. Got in the car and rode silently all the way home back to the dorm. And he said, I, I wanted to just take him apart, but he said, I didn't. And he said, I stopped the car and let him out and told him, son, just go to your room. And he said, I was so despondent. There went the Bible school. There went all we needed. That chance was gone. He said to himself, he said, I don't know what they're going to do. And he said, by the time he got home, his wife was standing there with the phone in her hand. And she said these words. It's that woman, that man's wife on the other end of the line. What happened? Dr. Finley said, I said to my wife, oh, my Lord, lawsuit. Oh, my goodness, what's going to happen now? And then on the other end of the line, the wife said to T.K. Finley these words. We don't know what's happened, but my husband is sitting up in bed. He's asked for the third bowl of soup. He's guzzling it down, and he's instructed me to tell you, please get in your car and come back. And oh, by the way, he also told me to tell you, don't come without that boy. I want to tell this church tonight, we're going to keep on singing the Lord's song. We're going to praise the Lord in face of impossibility. You know what the Lord spoke to my heart and said? We appreciate doctors and all that they do. But doctors can only assist. But our Lord is the healer. He's the mighty healer. So if you're ready tonight to start shouting and singing the Lord's song, if you're going through a trial, if you've received a bad report, if your spouse has walked out, if the kids have gone half nuts, let's make a declaration tonight. No matter what, we're going to keep singing the Lord's song. Let's stand, everybody, and clap your hands and give him praise. Give him glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's praise him, everybody. Let's praise him, everybody. Let's praise him, everybody. Hallelujah. I want everybody in this building to join hands with somebody. And I want you to let your faith soar like it has wings. And I want us to say this together out loud. In the name of Jesus, I will praise the Lord no matter what. I sing the Lord's song. Not only on the mountaintop, but in the valley. Hallelujah. I shout victory in the middle of the storm. Disease, infirmity, you have to die. In the name of Jesus, Pastor Kenny Foreman, we declare healing in the name of Jesus. Cancer has to die. In the name of Jesus, we sing the Lord's song and we shout the victory. In the name of Jesus, we call it done. Victory. Everybody in this building that says, Dwight Thompson, I have something in my life. I need to make it all right with God. All over this building, I just have something. I want to make it right with God. I've just got something in my life. I haven't been as close to God as I should be. I really haven't lived for him like I should live for him. But tonight, I'm giving it all for Jesus Christ. And I want you to lead me, Dwight Thompson, in a prayer that I can know beyond the shadow of a doubt that every sin is under the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you want this prayer, when I count to three, don't be embarrassed. You throw that hand up as high as you can get it. I've said this probably a thousand times in the course of my ministry. If the homosexual crowd 
can come out of the closet bragging that they're gay. It's about time born-again Christians get out of the closet and begin to shout it from the housetop that Jesus saves, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. God loves everybody. He can save anybody. And if you're in this room, you say, Dwight Thompson, lead me in that prayer. When I count to three, raise your hand up right now. One, two, three. Put it up. God bless you. I have something in my life. I need to make it right with God right now. I've got something in my life. I need to make it right with God. Many hands are lifted right now. Now let's pray this prayer together, everybody. Dear Lord Jesus, humbly and reverently, I confess I need you. Come into my heart. Wash all my sins away. Cleanse me and make me new. And in the name of Jesus, I believe that you're the Christ, the only Savior. It is not Jesus and Buddha. It is not Jesus and Mohammed. It is Jesus Christ, and he alone is my Lord and Savior. And all of the gods I reject. And I receive Jesus Christ, who shed his life's blood for my salvation. I trust you now, and I believe I am saved, forgiven. My sins are washed away. Victory is mine in Jesus' name. Let the church rejoice in Jesus' name. Let the church rejoice.